very much, everyone. Thanks very much for joining. My, my name is Lyndon Jones. I'm based at the School of Optometry and Vision Science at the University of Waterloo, and I'm director of CORE. CORE is the Centre for Ocular Research and Education. CORE is very fortunate to work with a number of industry partners to support our work. These are the current companies who we are working with and also the seven fundamental granting agencies as well. But my presentation tonight is going to be very generic and not related to any of these grants or companies. So this presentation really dates back to a paper that was written almost, uh, well, just almost exactly 30 years ago. So in, in April 1992, Nathan Efron, along with a variety of other authors, published a paper that says why fit contact lenses myth versus reality. And what basically Nathan and his colleagues did was it, he reflected on contact lens practice in the 1990s and looked at some of the common myths that practitioners had at that time, which was preventing them potentially fitting some of their patients with contact lenses. So what this presentation looks at is what have we learned over the past 30 years? What's changed over that time and what myths and fallacies do contact lens practitioners of today have? And how does that compare back to 30 years ago? So if we look at that paper back from 1992, we can see that basically Nathan listed eight myths and misconceptions. They kind of broadly break down into three categories. Those related to the lens and the care system, those related to the patient, and then some business factors. So taking that into consideration, myself and two colleagues, Karen Walsh and Kurt Moody from Johnson & Johnson um, and from CORE, basically looked at some current myths and misconceptions. We broke, again, it down into three pillars and we actually came up with 10 current myths and misconceptions. Now, for those of you who want more information on this, you can actually download this paper, this addressing common myths and misconceptions in soft contact lens practice is freely available to download from the Clinical Experimental Optometry website. So if you go to the journal Clinical and Experimental Optometry, you can download this paper free of charge, and that covers in much more detail what I'm going to cover tonight. Okay, so let's start with the first myth, and that is that increasing oxygen transmissibility actually improves lens comfort. And maybe some of you listening tonight think that that's the case, that if we give a patient more oxygen, then of course the lens is going to be more comfortable. So where does this idea come from? What, what's the basis behind this conception? Well, we know that improved comfort with increased oxygen transmissibility was first reported really back in the 1970s when patients were switched from PMMA lenses to RGPs. And a large number of presentations and lectures and papers around that time said that ultimately RGPs were more comfortable than PMMA. Now, with the introduction of silicon hydrogels, what we saw was a plethora of papers coming out saying, hey, when silicon hydrogels were commercialized in 1999, if you take your patients who are in hydrogel lenses and refit them into silicon hydrogels, what you'll find is that these patients have increased comfort. And there are numerous papers that were published that showed that to be the case. Now, the problem are the confounding factors related to that issue, because in many of these patients, what simply happened was patients were taken from wearing their hydrogels, given a new silicon hydrogel lens, and the patients said, yeah, my lenses are more comfortable. The problem is, is that there was no emission or there was no concurrent randomized mask control that enabled confirmation of that improvement in comfort to be an actual fact. And so many of these people actually had a, a placebo effect. You give them a new lens, they think it's better, Therefore, they report the fact that it's more comfortable. And even if it is more comfortable, it may not be oxygen that's actually producing that improved comfort. There are properties other than oxygen transmissibility that may be impacting comfort. Things like surface and bulk properties, or even things like edge design. And so the studies that were initially conducted and published that maybe appeared to support the fact that it was the oxygen that was driving comfort maybe wasn't as well controlled as it should be. So what does the evidence say? When we look at the evidence today, we see that four very large, well-written evidence-based reviews have actually concluded there is no overall comfort benefit obtained by merely increasing oxygen transport through the lens. And to date, no what we call level one studies, and level one studies mean studies in which there is a randomized, masked, controlled crossover design, so very well controlled, the standard way of proving a fact in, in any form of clinical study. To date, no level one studies have proven that increasing oxygen transmissibility alone is linked with increased contact lens comfort. 
More recently, studies investigating reusable silicon hydrogen materials have actually been unable to demonstrate any significant comfort benefits for silicon hydrogen materials over hydrogels. And again, more recent studies, again, have arrived at really the same conclusion, not just for reusable silicon hydrogels, but also for daily disposable materials as well. So how can we as clinicians apply this knowledge in practice? Well, we need to bear in mind that increased oxygen delivery has not been associated with higher levels of contact lens comfort in all cases, in all patients. And therefore, eye, eye care practitioners should choose the most suitable lens design for their patients to maximize comfort, and they can use a choice that they want between silicon hydrogel and hydrogel materials. So they should consider all materials because there will be some materials that will be better for patients. And it's not always the one with the highest oxygen transmissibility. Remember, comfort's driven by a number of factors, including lens design, surface and bulk chemistry, replacement frequency, and the patient themselves, the ocular surface and tear film, all play a part in comfort. And to just think that it's driven by oxygen alone is far too simplistic and simply not true. Okay, myth number two is kind of linked to the same thing, and that is that hydrogels should no longer be fit. And I'm sure that some of you out there, some recent practitioners maybe, maybe came around after the introduction or qualified after the introduction of silicon hydrogels and were really brought up in your clinical practice by pretty much only fitting silicon hydrogels. So is it true that hydrogels are now outdated and so should no longer be fit? So where does this idea come from? This idea really comes from the fact that many of the hydrogel lens materials we see today actually date back potentially to the 1970s. And we know that daily wear of silicon hydrogels has certainly eliminated hypoxic complications that were previously reported with materials of lower oxygen transmissibility. And that's particularly the case for those of our patients who have high prescription, so high plus or high minus, thicker lens profiles. So again, higher prescriptions, but also things like torix and multifocals, and certainly those who sleep in their lenses or, or are prescribed overnight wear lenses, so extended wear or continuous wear lenses. And that particularly is the case from a clinical perspective with limbal hyperemia. We have very good evidence about that fact that silicon hydrogels pretty much eliminate limbal hyperemia, which is a very good subtle indicator of whether the patient is getting sufficient oxygen or not. But what does the evidence say? If we look in the literature, what evidence is there for the fact that hydrogel shouldn't be fit? Well, if we look at the fitting rates of silicon hydrogels. Silicon hydrogels today account for about three quarters of all soft lens fits. So if we look at fitting surveys that are conducted around the world, around about three quarters of new lens fits occur in silicon hydrogels. But that of course means that that's another 26% that go into hydrogels. If you split that down more by replacement frequency, we see that almost 80% of reusable lenses are fit in silicon hydrogel materials, and almost 70% of daily disposable lenses are in silicon hydrogel. So certainly the majority of lenses fit these days are fit in silicon hydrogel, or majority of our patients are fit in silicon hydrogel materials. But bear in mind, that means that hydrogels account for approximately one quarter of new fits, two in 10 reusable fits, and three in 10 daily disposable fits. So even though, silicon hydrogels came out in 1999, hydrogels still play a role. They still play a role in current clinical practice. What else does the evidence say? Well, let's look at uh, physiological responses. Short-term corneal swelling study conducted actually by us in our institution in core was unable to demonstrate any difference in topographical corneal swelling between a hydrogel lens and no lens width. A comprehensive review of a hydrogel lens, etophil con A, demonstrates that many wearers, especially those wearing daily wear lenses, show no sign of hypoxic compromise when wearing hydrogels over many years. And a very recent study, again from our group, um, looking at daily disposable hydrogel lenses in children, showed that over a six year wear period, there were no hypoxic complications seen. So clearly in a significant number of patients, hydrogels do not result in significant hypoxic complications. So how can we apply this knowledge in practice? Well, we know that improved corneal physiology from decreased hypoxia with silicon hydrogel lenses is recognized. And the evidence published shows that for low to moderate prescriptions, daily wear hydrogel lenses do not 
significantly impact corneal physiology compared to silicon hydrogel lenses. So daily wear, low to moderate prescriptions, hydrogels appear to provide sufficient amounts of oxygen. Other things to think about with respect to hydrogels show that there is actually no impact on microbial keratitis rate or comfort between silicon hydrogels and hydrogels. There are reduced inflammatory responses of two times, two times less in reusable wear with hydrogel lenses compared with the re reusable silicon hydrogels. We're not sure why, but certainly hydrogel lenses on a reusable basis have a two times reduced inflammatory response. There are reduced mechanical complications because of the increased modulus of silicon hydrogels. And in some cases, hydrogels are also cheaper. So the evidence to date suggests that many valid reasons for eye care practitioners to still feel comfortable recommending hydrogel lenses, and they do remain an important option in modern contact lens practice. All right, number three, is it better to use a soft contact lens material that shows minimal deposition? Certainly when I was uh, graduating back in the mid 1980s, uh, the concept around trying to have a new lens that showed no deposition was something that uh, certainly we were looking for. So where does this idea come from, that we should be looking for low levels of deposition? Well, it dates really back to before the days of frequent replacement systems. Visible deposits were reported in lenses that were kept for a year or more, and these indeed eventually impacted vision and comfort. I certainly remember in my early years of, of practice seeing patients who wore horribly deposited lenses, poor vision, poor comfort. And so, you know, it immediately comes to mind, hey, if I can have something that shows no de deposition, that's gotta be better. A significant reduction in visible deposits definitely occur when lenses are replaced frequently and the length of time over which we see lenses replaced these days. So um, typically one month or less, we very rarely see visible deposits on lenses. And, a significant reduction seen in corneal infiltrative events and contact lens associated with pillary conjunctivitis when lenses are replaced frequently, particularly daily. So those three points would seem to suggest, hey, if we keep deposits to a minimum level, then of course that's, that's better. But what does the evidence say? Well, we know that visible deposits may be from the tear film or from extraneous sources, things like cosmetics, rust spots, etc. Now we know that soft contact lens materials are porous and the tear film components, or indeed there's extraneous sources as well, can be adsorbed onto the surface, but can also be absorbed into the bulk of the lens. Now, again, bearing in mind, these lenses are typically replaced these days in four weeks or less. And many types of deposits that get into and onto these lenses can't be seen clinically. They can only be quantified in the laboratory. So you may look at a lens material, it may look completely clean, you think, hey, there's no deposits there at all, but it's only when you take that lens and you extract the, the tear film components from it, can you see, hey, actually this lens has got an awful lot of, of protein, um, because what we know is that only denatured protein can be seen on lenses, and protein that's retained, that retains its activity, actually can't be seen. So the fact that the lens appears clean doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't have any position. An example of that is group four, ionic hydrogel materials. So negatively charged, so ionic hydrogel materials like etafilcon A absorb huge amounts of positively charged lysozyme from the tear film. And that occurs within seconds of the material being placed on the eye. So if you take a negatively charged lens, you put it into the tear film, positively charged proteins like lysozyme get sucked up into that lens very, very quickly. Now you might think, well, that can't be a good thing. Surely having lots of protein there isn't a good thing. But what we've also been able to show in a number of studies, in particular from groups like ours, is that the total amount of protein absorbed into that lens is actually unrelated to the comfort of the lens. The only correlation between deposition and tear film proteins that's been able to be shown is not related to the amount of protein, but actually the amount of denatured protein. So it's not so much how much protein is there, but it's whether that protein denatures and becomes inactivated. If the protein remains in its active state, the body doesn't recognize it, and really it has almost no impact on comfort or other responses at all. Now in vitro studies, so studies in the laboratory demonstrate the importance 
of maintaining these low levels of denatured protein. It's only when proteins start to denature that you start to see their interaction with cells and that produces, it's the denatured protein that seems to produce these or cause these cells to release inflammatory things like cytokines and reduce corneal cell metabolic activity. But it's not related to the amount of protein, it's related to how active or denatured that is. Again, we were able to show in some studies in our laboratory that etophilcon A, that negatively charged lens material, so the ionic material, whilst it does take up a lot of protein, the majority of that lysozyme remains in its natural state. It doesn't denature and therefore does not interact with the ocular surface and produce any complications. So it's not true that necessarily having a lens that has no deposits is better than having a lens that has truckloads of deposits, so long as those truckloads of deposits remain in their normal active state. So how can we apply this knowledge? Well, remember that visible deposition does not correlate with total deposition in the contact lens. You can have what looks like a very clean lens with tons of protein on it. There's no evidence the fitting lenses that actually deposit low amounts of tear film components will result in increased comfort. However, there is some evidence that correlates subjective comfort to the proportion of active lysozyme and also the amount of lipid absorbed into some silicon hydrils. So the, the fact it, it's, not sim, it, it's not as simple as saying that high levels of deposit will result in poor comfort. That's, uh, that's not the case at all. Okay, let's move on to myth number four. Okay, myth number four, when a patient reports discomfort, so a patient comes into your practice, the first thing I'm gonna do is change the lens. It must be the lens that's at fault. And so I'm just gonna try them with a different lens, true or false. Well, again, where does this idea come from? Where does the idea come from that when a patient comes in with poor comfort, it's gotta be related to the lens, I'm gonna try them in a new lens material. Well, it comes really from the fact of, that many of us have had the experience that simply changing to an alternative lens can actually help some patients. Patients come in with poor comfort, you try a new lens material, and not infrequently, that will actually get the patient to report, yeah, you know what, these are better. These are better than my old ones. Now that belief in changing a lens material can make a difference in comfort, typically occurs from changing from a hydrogel to a silicon hydrogel. And remember what the first myth that we talked about, that may not necessarily be the case because sometimes there could be a placebo effect. Um, and certainly it's not simple to, to tease out what about that new lens is producing that improved comfort. The other reason that this thought has come about is the belief that changing lens replacement frequency can improve comfort as well. And that's typically a change from a frequent replacement lens, so either a monthly or a two weekly frequent replacement lens to a daily disposal. And there is no doubt that sometimes that does work. Patients report improved comfort, but not all the time. Now, a number of assumptions exist that do appear to be logical steps to take to alter that comfort experience, changing to a more frequent replacement or changing from maybe a hydrogel to a sci high. But what of those are actually evidence-based? Which, which of those choices, when we look at the published evidence, is actually supported and is true? Well, sci-high materials, as we've already shown, have not been shown to be more comfortable than hydrogels. Sometimes they are, but not always. And it certainly isn't because of the increased oxygen. There are other properties that affect comfort as well. Making sure, for example, that the lens fits well. You can have a very well-designed lens in a great lens material, but if that lens doesn't fit well, we know that comfort will be worse. Increasing replacement frequency, certainly moving from a frequent replacement to a daily disposable can sometimes improve comfort. Um, and again, another factor that we know is that from looking at the literature using materials that have very good in-eye wettability and low surface friction, so lens surfaces that have that in which the lid can move very easily over because they've got a, a very, uh, a very, if you like, lubricious type surface also have proven to be very comfortable. So changing the lens, either via its fit material and or frequent replacement, or frequent re replacement frequency rather, are evidence-based options that can impact comfort performance. But it's not always that we can do that. We, sometimes, particularly if the patient needs a specialist lens, patient lens preference or high prescription, 
doesn't, we can't always just change the lens and show. What else should we be considering? Well, remember the care solution. Again, we have good evidence about the fact that certain patients do better with certain lens materials or with certain uh, replacement systems, with certain solutions. So you can take a patient who's using a particular lens material, not getting on too well, change the solution system to something else, and they'll, in, they'll uh, report increased comfort. So don't forget the option to switch the solution rather than switching the lens. Another thing that we very often forget is to optimize the health of the ocular surface. Bear in mind that even the best lens material and best lens solution is not going to work very well if the patient has a poor ocular surface. Poor quality tear film, things like meibomian gland dysfunction, blepharitis, um, demodex infestation, any of those ocular surface compl complications will certainly reduce the comfort of the lens. And I think far too often we think about when a patient comes in with poor comfort, it's got to be the lens. Maybe it could be the solution. We forget that it could be the patient. And we certainly have very good emerging evidence that symptoms of discomfort in contact lens wearers can be reduced through management of the lid margin and ocular surface. So again, how can we apply this knowledge in practice? Well, significant improvements in contact lens comfort can be achieved by changing the lens in many cases, no doubt, but not always. Comfort can also be improved by managing any lid margin pathology that's present, such as managing blepharitis, meibomian gland dysfunction, and optimizing the ocular surface and improving the quality of the tear film. And in order to enhance the comfort of all of our contact lens wearers, I think we need to be proactive and always assess lid margin health, meibomian gland expressibility, meibom quality and tear film stability in all contact lens patients and also in all prospective contact lens patients before they start wearing lenses. Make sure that ocular surface is pristine and healthy and then address any issues that are found. So it's not always changing the lens that can be the thing that will solve the issue. All right, number five, let's start now. We know that contact lenses are great for all ages, right through from young through to old. And this is particularly the case now as we start to see better presbiopic lenses for the older individuals and also a growth in the numbers of options available for myopia management in young children. So myth number five relates to that younger age group. Young children struggle with contact lenses and I really don't like fitting young kids because I don't think they're going to get on very well. Now, where does this idea come from? Well, we know that eye care practitioners certainly prefer to fit preteens with spectacles rather than contact lenses. And why is that? Well, it really arises out of two beliefs. The first belief that the risks of contact lens wear outweigh the benefits in young children. It's just too risky to fit young kids. And fitting young children simply takes too much chair time. I don't have the time to do that. It's going to take me too long. It's going to, you know, I can fit, I can, I can fit contact lenses to, to older kids and uh, adults and fit uh, more spectacle patients. I, I'm not going to go down the route of fitting kids with contact lenses. But what does the evidence say? Well, in the US, just over 11% of 7,000 fits in the International Prescriber Room Report between 2002 and 2014 were to children up to the age of 15. So about one in 10 of all of those fits were in that younger age group. And contact lenses are considered really as a secondary option to spectacles by up to 71% of practitioners for children up to the age of 12. So certainly the literature, the published evidence would show that, yep, that is the case. Practitioners, generally speaking, do not like fitting kids under the age of probably 14 to 15 with contact lenses. They would much rather fit them with spectacles. Now, to some extent, things are changing. Um, in, a, in a more recent paper, about one in five of eye care practitioners were more likely to fit 10 to 12 year olds with contact lenses than they did the year before because of the growing availability of daily disposable lenses, improved lens materials, and also requests from the child or parent. I think patients and uh, parents are becoming much more likely to say, hey, is there any chance that my kid may be suitable 
for contact lenses. Maybe it could be for things like, you know, acting or sports. Um, but we're certainly seeing a big case now for patients because of the growth in myopia management. Now, a 2019 survey, so much more recent survey, reported the minimum age that eye care practitioners are, uh, consider children suitable for myopia control lenses range from about seven, well, almost eight years old in Europe up to almost 11 years old in Asia. But look how much that's changed. It's changed from that 14 to 15 age down to eight to, to nine. So we certainly are seeing a reduction in the age at which practitioners feel comfortable fitting kids. And that's primarily driven by an expansion in the daily disposable availability and also the expectations of both parents and kids as well. We do have excellent evidence that young children gain positive benefits from contact lenses and certainly eye care practitioners have to be comfortable fitting young kids if they're considering myopia management. Many of these kids that are going into lenses are in the sort of six to eight, nine years old age group, much, much younger than, than typically they would have been prepared to be comfortable fitting them maybe 10 years ago. We also have good evidence that there actually is no increase in chair time for the fitting process. Fitting a child takes no more time than fitting an adult. However, it does take about an extra 15 to 20 minutes for insertion and removal and wear and care training. So there is an increase in time, but it's not for us as the practitioner for fitting. It's really more around the uh, teaching them how to put lens in, take them out, and how to look after them. And hopefully we can push that over on to support staff. So do plan for your support staff to allow extra time for that wear and care training for kids compared with adults. The other really important thing to remember is that safety data in young children is really very assuring. The, the, the results and safety of kids wearing lenses is really not that different to adults. In fact, it may even be safer because kids typically end up doing what you tell them to do, unlike adults. So it's important for us as clinicians to support the child and parents with, with very clear instructions and reminders about safe wear and care practices. Myopia management is very definitely a growing and increasing focus and contact lenses are quite clearly an important option. We do have, of course, drug options and spectacle options, but contact lens options, whether it be soft lens options or orthokeratology, are both proven to, to work really very well in terms of myopia management. So I feel that now is a good time to embrace the, the routine recommendation of contact lenses to a younger age group. Okay, so that's myth number five. Now let's switch to the other end of the age group, the presbytes. Myth number six, multifocal fitting is simply not successful. We're gonna fit multifocals because they're far too hard to, to fit. They're just not successful. So where does this idea about multifocals being not worth fitting? Well, eye care practitioners, when you survey them, certainly feel that they lack the requisite knowledge to successfully fit multifocal lenses. The fitting prize box takes more chair time than fitting younger patients and the success rates are too low. Now, if you imagine that they have those three thoughts in mind, it's no wonder that really they don't particularly want to fit multifocal lenses. Concerns certainly remain about dropout in this population. So even when you do fit them, uh, we are able to show, or publications have shown that the one year retention rate of new wearers in that 16 to 24, so the younger age group, is around about 87%, and that drops down in the 60 plus age group down to around about two thirds, about 64%. So it certainly does drop in that older age group. So again, you've taken all this time and effort to fit them, and then one year out, only about two thirds of them are actually two thirds of the presbobes are continuing to wear their lenses. And when you, again, survey the dropout in that age group, dryness, discomfort, and poor vision, poor vision being a big one, are the most common reasons for dropout in this age group. So that's basically why practitioners have this concept around the fact that multifocals are too much effort to fit, and I'm not gonna bother doing it. But what does the evidence say? Well, one thing to bear in mind is that presbopes represent a large and growing group of patients with a variety of visual needs. And certainly when we look at our existing contact lens wearers, so these were wearers that we fit maybe 20 years or so ago and are now becoming presbopic. They don't wanna come out of their contact lenses. 
And it's interesting that about 40% of the existing contact lens wearer dip base is aged 40 years or over. Almost 95% of them expect to continue in contact lenses. They, they don't want to come out of lenses. They've spent many years wearing them. And hey, now I'm presbyopic doesn't mean that I should come out of lenses. But sadly, about 50% of them will drop out from the published data so far when they become presbyopic. In terms of new wearers, there are a large group of emerging presbytes who are new to spectacles, are frustrated by them, and may benefit from the option of contact lenses, at least on a part-time basis. So they become presbyopic, they wear spectacles, but then they go out, they don't want to have to pop their spectacles on, they'd really love to be able to have the option of being able to wear contact lenses when they go out for dinner, go to a restaurant, that kind of thing. When we look at the prescribing rates, definitely under prescribing of contact lenses occurs in this presbyopic age group. And indeed, recent global data published just in January of this year when shows that when presbyopes are fit with contact lenses, um, there's a variety of options used. About 40% are fit with single vision distance and then use readers over the top. About 11% use monovision and only about half, only 49% of the presbyopes that were, um, that data was gathered on in this very large global survey were fit with the multifocal correction. So despite the fact that we do have a wide variety of multifocal options available, practitioners are only using them in this age group in about half of the patients, the other half being fit with single vision distance or monovision. So how can we apply this knowledge again in practice? How can we apply this concept? Well, we know because we have really good data that modern soft multifocal contact lenses are available in a wide range of materials, replacement frequencies, and optical designs, and they work. The performance of modern multifocals is way better than it was 10 years ago, way better even than it was five years ago. And there is a large opportunity that exists to offer multifocal contact lenses to presbytes, both existing wearers, existing contact lens wearers, and also neophytes. So how can we maximize success? Well, there are some very simple tips. The first one being follow the fit guide. Every single presbyopic lens that comes to market has a fit guide and the way that you fit it has, the, the companies have spent a long time developing those fit guides. The way that one lens fits is not the same as the way that another lens fits. So don't think that you can just apply your prior knowledge and information to get a good fit, read that fit guide and apply the rules. Assess vision with real life tasks. Don't just assess vision in the consulting room, have them have an extended trial or a diagnostic process whereby they're actually able to assess how that lens is performing with their real life tasks at home. So allow that patient time to try the lens with their own visual tasks and gain confidence by starting with eyes that have a healthy ocular surface and tear film. So if as you're about to fit these patients, it looks like the tear film isn't ideal, looks like the ocular surface isn't ideal, treat that first before you try using the lens. I would say very definitely be proactive and positive, set realistic expectations and help more presbyopes gain freedom from spectacles for many aspects of their busy, active daily lives. Okay, number seven, we've talked about presbyopic fits. What about astigmatic fits? Now again, myth number seven, patients with low astigmatism do just fine with spherical lenses. You don't need to correct that astigmatism, they just do fine. So where does that idea come from? Well, there's probably six different points worth bearing in mind. The first relate to the fact that historically, early generation torix had relatively poor rotational stability. So the quality of vision wasn't as good as it should be. They were relatively poor comfort because the initial lens designs were fairly thick. There is a concept that masking of low astigmatism is possible with, six, with thick soft lenses or a spheric design. So if I've got a patient who's got three quarters of a diopter of astigmatism, I'm not going to bother fitting a toric lens. I'm going to put a nice thick um, spherical soft lens on there. That'll mask the astigmatism and they won't even notice it. Some of the early soft toric designs really did have unpredictable fitting characteristics. When you got the lens to fit, if it needed a replacement, it wasn't necessarily uh, going to work as well. They did initially take um, longer chair time, so they were more problematic to fit. And a lot of practitioners feel from their prior experiences 
that really when I fit a toric lens, it's going to cost the patient more. There's going to be an increased fitting fee. So the patient's not going to be happy because I'm going to be billing them more because it's taking me more time. Individual lens costs and replacement costs are higher. And honestly, the patient doesn't really benefit that much. So why would I just not fit a spherical lens? So that's where the concept comes from. What do we know in terms of the actual realities? Well, the first thing that we need to look at is the prevalence of clinically relevant corneal astigmatism. And we've actually, our group has published a number of papers on this. And from a very, very large clinical database of over 100,000 patients, we found that just over 50%, so 52.5% of the patients in this clinical data set had greater than or equal to three quarters of adopter cell in at least one eye and just over 30 percent so almost 32 percent have three quarters of adopter cell in both eyes now there's no doubt about the fact that when we look at fitting surveys and you can see that big graph here from uh, philip morgan's survey um, from eurolens that toric lens fitting has definitely increased you can see that that graph is going up over the years it's definitely increased over the last 20 years although it's still really below the population prevalence in many cases. And it's also differences in countries. Some countries just simply do not like fitting toric lenses compared with others. So what does the evidence say about if I don't correct those low amounts of astigmatism? Well, again, we have lots and lots of data that shows that actually uncorrected astigmatism definitely has an impact on suboptimal vision correction. So one diopter of uncorrected astigmatism significantly impacts distance and near acuity, reading speed and fluency, and stereo acuity. Viewing a computer screen, which pretty much all of our patients do these days, with uncorrected astigmatism of as little as three quarters of a diopter, increases discomfort, results in blurred vision and headache. When we look at contact lens dropouts, there is an, an increased number of uncorrected astigmats. So astigmats over-index in the number of contact lens dropouts and dissatisfaction with vision is cited by both existing and new wearers. So not correcting that small amount of astigmatism does have a signif significant number of visual impacts. What are some of the benefits of correcting low levels of astigmatism? And again, a number of papers of which I've just highlighted two here show that basically if you fit low to moderate astigmats, so less than or equal to one diopter sill with toric lenses compared with spherical lenses, visual acuity is better, the patients prefer the torics uh, for overall performance and also visual performance. So we have lots of good data to show that not correcting astigmatism is bad and also lots of good information to show that correcting astigmatism is good. So we've got both aspects covered there. Now I'm going to come on to that, this masking of astigmatism. I hear it all the time. Oh, you know, if, if I have a patient who's got three quarters of a diopter of corneal cell, I can just put a spherical lens on and if it's nice and thick, then it's, it's going to mask the astigmatism. Okay, so here's an example. Here's one of our researchers who has exactly that. They've got one diopter of corneal cell. So this is their astigmatism um, with no lens in place. Okay, so that's the topography showing very clearly one dark of astigmatism. I'm now going to take a spherical hydrogel lens, pop it on the eye, let it settle for five to 10 minutes, and then do topography over the top of that lens to see how much astigmatism I've masked. So I'm going to use a spherical hydrogel lens. How much do I mask? Nothing. Absolutely nothing whatsoever. So a floppy flexible hydrogel lens masks nothing. Okay, well, that didn't work. Tell you what, I'm now gonna use a silicon hydrogel. Silicon hydrogels, increased modulus, that, that will definitely mask it. I'm now gonna take a silicone hydrogel spherical lens, pop it on the eye, leave it for 10 to 15 minutes, that'll mask the astigmatism. Let's see what happens. Does it? No, not at all. Doesn't mask a thing. So if you've got a patient who's got 075 or one diopter of corneal cell, it doesn't matter whether you use a spherical hydrogel, or a spherical silicone hydrogel, you ain't gonna mask astigmatism. It just doesn't happen. And numerous publications have proven this to be the case. The other thing is related to modern toric lenses. 
again, lots of publications showing that modern toric lenses are relatively simple and fast to fit. The average lens fit times are really under 25 minutes. More than 80% are successful on first attempt and a very high success rate after one month of wear. The other thing is, is the wide availability of Torx these days. Years ago, it wasn't, you know, you couldn't always fit patients because not all parameters were available. Again, that's changed, changed enormously, particularly over the last two to three years. And today's modern Torx lenses provide prescription coverage for over 95% of prescriptions in frequent replacement modalities. And that covers daily disposable, two week and four week frequency of replacement. So that whole concept that toric lenses are hard to fit and they simply aren't enough parameters available is again, simply not true. So how can we apply this knowledge in practice? Well, I think we need to proactively recommend soft torics to patients. Ideally, you'd order trial lenses or source from a diagnostic bank ahead of the fitting time where possible. So if you have a patient coming in for a toric fit, try and get a lens in that you think will work for that patient's prescription. And again, use real world visual targets to check vision and assess that rotational stability by simulating real world eye and head movement. So takeaway message, low astigmats gain visual benefits from being fully corrected and modern soft toric contact lenses are quick to fit with reliable performance. Okay, moving on to number eight, myth number eight. Concerns about contact lens related complications mean I, I don't, I'm not comfortable fitting contact lens patients. I know in particular, non-compliant patients are gonna to have tons of problems. I'm just not gonna fit them. True or false? Well, where does this idea come from? Well, we know that full adherence to correct wear and care habits for contact lens wearers is difficult to achieve for all patients all the time. And probably 95% of patients are at some point in time non-compliant. We do know also that non-compliant practices are associated with increased risk and the overall incidence of a number of contact lens com complications, some of which can be fairly severe. Contact lens complications are relatively common, being seen in around about one third of wearers, although most of these are mild and relatively easily managed. But we do know that complications range from the rare but serious, such as microbial keratitis, through to relatively mild examples such as asymptomatic corneal infiltrative events, and that the, the incidence of these complications is unquestionably affected by non-compliant behaviors. So things like poor hand hygiene, incorrect cleaning, sleeping in the lenses overnight, and other factors as well, such as uh, not replacing your lens when it's supposed to be replaced. So there is no doubt about the fact that complications do occur. Those complications are more likely to occur in non-compliant patients and the majority of patients are indeed non-compliant. So when you think about that, doesn't that mean that this myth is true? Well, kind of yes and no. It is correct that wearers are not always compliant and that can increase the risk of complications. However, the behaviors that are non-compliant are what we call modifiable. In other words, you can train a patient to not do them and this, this worry about, oh, well, all my patients are gonna be non-compliant, they're all gonna have problems, simply isn't true. Um, and shouldn't certainly shouldn't prevent contact lenses from being recommended for the vast majority of patients. Now, some patients we know are just so non-compliant, it's just, you, know, you really don't want them in your practice, but that's incredibly rare. So how can we apply this knowledge in practice? Well, we certainly at every progress check, every aftercare, we need to routinely review the steps for wear and care of soft lenses with patients. Pay particular attention to questioning the patient about hand hygiene, washing their hands, avoidance of water, avoidance of closed eye wear, so inadvertently or choosing to sleep in the lenses, performing correct cleaning procedures and replacing their lenses and lens cases as directed and on time. Poor compliance can increase the risk of contact lens related complications and must, patients must be educated about these risks. But the good news is, is that a number of strategies are available to help support patients to modify these risky behaviors and reduce the chance of these complications occurring. So education, regular retraining at follow-up visits and choosing the best available lens replacement frequency can all help to reduce those. Okay, so two, two myths to go. And these are both business related. The first one of which is 
related to the point that, hey, contact lens practice is just not profitable. I'm not going to fit lenses because I just simply can't make money out of it. Now, where on earth does that concept arrive? So this idea comes from the fact that only a small number of patients actually ask for contact lenses. If we sit there and we wait for patients to ask us for contact lenses, actually only a small number of patients will do that. Now it is challenging to balance the time required for contact lens practice with the demands of routine eye care and certainly increasing the number of contact lens wearers in the business can impact spectacle sales. And I think some practitioners have that concept, well, I mean, it's so much, so much easier to make money out of, contact, uh, out of spectacle sales and it's, it's much harder to make it out of contact lens, whereas I'm, I'm not really going to try and grow my business by fitting more lenses. And patients do require a lot more chair time when first fit with lenses. Many drop out quickly and it's not worth the effort. Now, that's not true, but it's, I think, in lots of practitioners' minds. The other thing to bear in mind is that a lot more referrals come from contact lens wearers than from spectacle wearers. So what does the actual evidence say? Well, what's interesting is that proactive recommendation of contact lenses makes a significant different difference to the numbers of patients wearing lenses. What we mean by that is rather than the practitioner waiting for the patient to say, hey, any, any chance I could try contact lenses or do you think contact lenses might be suitable for me? How about saying to every spectacle wearer, hey, you ever thought about wearing lenses? You know, you don't necessarily need to wear them all the time, but how about part time? How about having an option to be able to not wear your specs every time you go out or for social events? How about the option of wearing contact lenses? Now, that proactive making a recommendation to the patient definitely works. There's at least five papers that have shown that that very definitely drives more wearers in your practice, but it's still not routinely being done by all eye care practitioners. And very Sadly, less than one third of patients who've been in a practice when surveyed actually recall hearing their eye care practitioner recommending that contact lenses may be an option for them. So again, surveying patients, nearly two thirds of spectacle only wearers expect their eye care practitioner to actually advise them about their suitability for contact lenses. They're not going to ask for contact lenses because they're sitting there thinking, well, if they didn't suggest contact lenses to me, then it's probably because I'm not suitable for them. But two thirds of patients feel it should be our responsibility to offer those if the patient is a suitable option. And when we look at the results of proactive recommendation, papers have showed that if you do that, you get about five times increase in contact lens trials and about a six times increase in the contact lenses purchased. Now, the, another thing to bear in mind is actually using contact lenses as an aid to selecting new spectacle frames. When patients are trying to select their frames, of course, they've got no prescription there, actually it becomes quite difficult for them to see what their face looks like. And in studies where the practitioner has said, hey, I'm just gonna pop a pair of contact lenses in you to help you choose your spectacle frames, you know, are you interested? In those situations where patients did opt for a contact lens trial, during their spectacle dispensing, subjects spent one third more on their spectacles. They reported higher levels of satisfaction, two and a half times more likely to schedule a full follow-up contact lens fit, and two and a half times more patients purchased contact lenses, at least for part-time wear. So again, something else to think about is using that, is using contact lenses as an option for when patients are choosing their specs. So again, how can we apply this knowledge? Well, bear in mind, patients expect us to inform them if they're suitable for contact lenses. And eye care practitioners, I certainly feel, should proactively recommend lenses to patients. When I was in practice, one of those papers I talked about was actually published from out of our practice when I was there. And it revolutionized our practice when we proactively recommended lenses to every single spectacle wearer. I think we tend to pigeonhole patients into being, hey, you're a spectacle wearer you're a contact lens wearer. My view is that every spectacle wearer should be offered the opportunity to become a contact lens wearer, at least on a part-time basis. Offering contact lenses to help with spectacle frame selection definitely works. 
And I think we need to have confidence in the minimal chair time and high fit success rates for not just spherical lenses, but also torics and multifocals. The other thing to bear in mind is that these patients that you're proactively recommending contact lenses to are already in your practice. It costs nothing to market to them. We think about spending a lot of money marketing to new patients, but before spending effort marketing to those, ensure routine proactive recommendation of contact lenses and offer contact lens trials to all of your current patients. Okay, we're at myth number 10. Myth number 10, another business one. And that is, oh, it's hard to grow a contact lens business because I've been doing that. And you know what? I reckon that as many patients drop out of contact lenses as a fit. True or false? Well, where does this idea come from? It comes from the fact that there is dropout. Dropout from contact lens wear does remain an issue. There's no doubt about that. Contact lens performance is simply not good enough for some patients. Comfort and vision issues are mainly responsible for driving them out of lenses. And sure, it does take some valuable chair time to fit a new contact lens wearer. And if dropouts are high, then maybe it isn't worth the effort. So that's where that concept comes from of, you know what, growing a contact lens practice is just too much like hard work. OK, but what does the evidence show? How common is dropout? Well, it's not as common, maybe, fortunately, as we would think. The average dropout frequency across a variety of studies is about 20%. So about one in five wearers cease wearing lenses. And the retention rate in the first year in a multi-site prospective study was about one quarter of new wearers. And the reason that those new wearers drop out actually differ from existing wearers. Let's take a little look at that. Well, in established wearers, so existing wearers, dryness and discomfort are the most commonly cited reasons for dropping out. Whereas in new wearers, it's actually more likely to be vision related issues, handling, and also discomfort. So discomfort is the only thing common to both, but in new wearers, vision and handling are big issues. Um, and so it's very important that uh, particularly for patients who are fit with multifocals or torics, we optimize that vision. And in all new wearers, um, we ensure that handling is good before they leave the practice and then follow them up when they go home. So dropout reasons vary. It's not all about discomfort. Focus on early support with handling for new wearers. Do follow up early to see how they're coping at home. Ensure astigmats and presbytes are offered toric and multifocal lenses respectively. And we've already talked about that in some of the earlier myths. Modern torics and multifocals work very well but ensure that the patient is satisfied with their vision performance and proactively ask about comfort performance. Address where issues are reported or where there's a gap of two hours or more between total and comfortable wear time. Now we often ask patients, hey, how many hours do wear your lenses for? The killer question that we fail to ask is how many hours are they comfortable for? And ideally we want that total wear time to only be, um, to not be that different to comfortable wear time. If comfortable wear time is two hours or more different, then we've got a problem that we need to address. So in conclusion, when we look at those 10 common myths and misconceptions that are in this recent paper, which is now ex almost exactly 30 years on from the initial paper, when we look at those three pillars, those myths and misconceptions related to contact lens and solution, the patient related issues and the business factors. When we look at the evidence, what we're able to show is that for all 10 of those common myths, they really are that, they're myths. They're not true at all. There is extremely good evidence about the fact that all 10 of those issues can be overcome with careful thought and attention. With that, I'll say thanks very much for your attention. And we'll see if we have any questions. So we've got a couple in the chat here to make it a bit bigger. So first question, do aspheric lenses allow, allow astigmats better vision than spherical lenses? There are a couple of papers that have suggested that maybe that is the case, but honestly, in the vast majority of situations, no, aspheric lenses permit no better vision with low astigmats than spherical lenses. If you have a patient with three quarters of adapter or more of astigmatism, 
you need to fit those patients with toric lenses and not try to get away with masking it with spherical lenses or aspherics. Okay, next question. Many of my multifocal fits have low amounts of astigmatism that can make or break the success of the fit. Any tips when staying in a daily multifocal contact lens? <clears throat> well, again, I think really it's all about optimizing that vision. The, it, it's interesting because um, when you look at that prevalence of astigmatism and you then break it down into the presbarpic astigmats, um, there are a significant number of presbiopes who do need their tericity correcting as well. Now, fortunately, these days, we actually do have good multifocal toric lenses. So those are certainly way better than they were five years or so ago. So that's one particular option. Um, any tips when staying in a daily multifocal contact lens? Um, again, I, I would just say, make sure you optimize the vision. And if you can't get good vision with one design, then potentially try a different design because the, the subtleties in designs that are available these days are, are quite varied. And certainly for some patients, depending upon the shape of their cornea, the size of their pupil, whether the lens that you're using is center near or center distance, um, certainly um, certain designs for certain patients work a lot better. Next question, do you charge a contact lens fit when you offer a patient a trial pair of lenses? when selecting glasses in the optical. I don't, so what I, what I basically used to do with that is I would do that free of charge. So I'd basically just pop a pair of lenses in just for the experience for the patient. I wouldn't charge a fitting fee. In the study that we published, what we interestingly did was that we offered patients a free trial where we would fit them. They would go away with lenses for a week and then come back. If they went ahead, with ordering lenses, then we they had to pay a full fitting fee. But to take away that disincentive um, of, of patients trying lenses when they maybe weren't quite sure that they wanted to, we actually did do a, a free diagnostic trial. But then if they went ahead, they got charged full fees. And honestly, when we look at, we, we, we fit six times more patients, it was a risk worth taking because the number of patients who didn't go ahead and therefore I was effectively doing a free trial and losing money on it was far less than the money I made from converting patients into uh, contact lens wires. Okay, I think we have run out of time. I, I really do appreciate your attention. I, I hope you enjoyed that. And I hope it can be uh, useful for you in practice and hopefully we've dispelled some of those myths. With that, I'll say thanks very much and good night from me. Thank you.